tales have been told since man first gathered around the fires of prehistory. Tales of the strange and wondrous things hidden in the vast unknown shadows of the world. Tales of creatures divine and beasts demonic, of gods and kings, of myths and monsters. From dark forests to the lands of ice, from desert wastes to the storm-thrashed seas, every corner of the earth has its legends to tell. Stories of heroes and the villains they encounter, of the wilderness and the dangers within. Stories of battles, of love, of order, and of chaos. But what are the roots of these fantastic tales? And why have they endured so long? In this series, we'll explore the history behind these legends and reveal the hidden influences that shaped them. War and disease, religious and social upheaval, the untamable ferocity of the natural world. And above all, the monsters lurking within ourselves. For most of our existence on Earth, humans were hunter-gatherers. We foraged for survival, living on what we could scavenge, always on the move. All this changed around 10,000 years ago, when mankind formed its first permanent settlements when we started growing crops and domesticating animals. The agricultural revolution had begun. The settlements grew, towns formed, then cities, nations and empires. But it took more than living side by side to form a community. Shared traditions and beliefs were needed. And shared stories. It's through stories that the boundaries of a community were set. That their rules were tested. That they coped with change. All society is going through periods of rapid change, desperately need myths to hang on to. Sometimes myths seem to exist to question social norms and to ask us to question them. That's a much better way of enforcing social norms than the kind of story which just says, this is the social norm, this is what you're going to do. I think if one sees it as a kind of vehicle in narrative form for things which are important in society, that's probably the best way of thinking of it. So a lot of myths involve characters, heroes, heroines, debating what they should do, and in that way, a norm gets defined. Myths, of course, can only become myths if we share them. We're a community of readers of the Bible. We share faith in those stories. So myths create community. They bond us together. Societies exist in a state of tension. The needs and wants of all can never be satisfied at the same time. A balance must be found. It's in the stories we tell each other that we debate what that balance is. The laws of the kingdom were clear. Prince Roswell had broken them. He had disobeyed his father, the king. The three noblemen had been in the dungeon for years. They were blamed by the king for a crime they did not commit. Roswell was not his father, however. The injustice done to the three men shamed him. 
he had to do something. Roswell led the nobles out of the dungeon, past the guards, and through the secret, silent passages of the castle to freedom. But Roswell's father soon discovered who was responsible for the prisoner's escape. Roswell would pay a price for its kindness. The king banished his son, sending him forever into exile. The law, after all, was the law. It is a comforting thought that we have control over our destiny. The random cruelty of the world can seem at times too much to bear. Stories offer a haven. Good is rewarded, evil punished, and everyone gets their just deserts. In a story, even catastrophe has a reason. The rivers of central Germany carve through field and hill on their journey to the distant sea. For centuries, these waterways have borne goods and people up and down the country. Riverside towns grew rich on the back of this trade. One of their settlements was the town of Hamlin. Hamlin was an important center for the shipping of grain. It was on the Visa River. It got lots of grain coming in, it milled it, and it shipped it out. So it was one of the relatively new towns which were becoming very, very important. Much like all German towns of that age, it would have had a social structure. It would have had a class of Bürger, what we would call bourgeoisie, that is to say qualified citizens of the, of the town. It would have been dominated by guilds rather than aristocrats. So one would begin to see the sort of structure that would eventually evolve into the modern city. Hamlin is most famous, however, for the story of the Pied Piper. It's one of the best-known tales of the Brothers Grimm. In their telling, Hamlin was wealthy and thriving. Its citizens lived happily in their fine grey stone houses, until an infestation of rats inflicted misery on the town. This black swarm of vermin attacked barns and storehouses. They gnawed on wood and chewed through cloth. Try as they might, the people could not rid themselves of the plague. Salvation seemed to come in the figure of a mysterious piper. He lured the rats into the river with a magical song. But when the town refused to pay him what was promised, the piper swore revenge. Returning to the town, he played his song once more. But this time, it was the town's children he entranced. He marched them out of Hamelin and into a mountain cave. Neither piper nor children were ever seen again. There's more to it, however, than mere legend. In 1384, the Hamlin Chronicle recorded that a century had passed since the children had left the town. Something did happen in Hamlin. But what? Because there's a specific date, there's a suggestion that, well, maybe this started as a real story. And then you get the kind of speculation of what is going on. I think we can say deductively, well, in all probability, it will have had its origin in some kind of social and cultural crisis. That's what the stories are there for. They're there to resolve that crisis. What kind of crisis might that have been? Well, we, we don't know. We can speculate. Some suggest that a disease or famine must have struck Hamlin. The piper was symbolic of the death which carried the town's children away. Others have linked the story to the dancing plagues of medieval Europe. This bizarre trend saw thousands of people dance together in a state of frenzy until collapsing from exhaustion. A more convincing theory is that the legend of the Pied Piper is a story of migration 
The town's children were in fact citizens who left Hamlin en masse in the late 13th century. This was a time when recruiters traveled across Central Europe seeking settlers for land further east. They offered rewards for those willing to move. Thousands took up the offer. In Eastern Europe, you had these huge empty tracts of land, and landowners would actually hire agents to go find people to come and farm the land. So this may actually be a story of immigration. There are some names which contain the etymology of Hamlin, and it is possible that perhaps 100 or 150 of the youth of Harmon wandered away, and that the tale therefore has its origins in that great division of the population. The Grimms recorded their version of the story in the 1800s. But the tale had been told and retold in Europe since the Middle Ages, and it evolved along the way. Once you get people living in cities and they're crowded, you begin to see a change in the kind of stories they tell themselves or they tell each other. There are no rats in the original story. The idea of the bargain comes in even slightly later. Then by the time the 19th century comes along, you begin to get a much more sentimental thing, the little lame boy or the little blind boy, depending on the version, who can't keep up with his fellows and therefore, you know, the mountain closes before he can get there. So it's a wonderful example of how myths will change as society changes. The story of the Pied Piper is one of social norms broken. Hamelin loses its children, not to the random cruelty of sickness or war, but because of his own people's actions. They broke their agreement with the Piper. Their greed and dishonesty are responsible for the disappearance of the children. In times scarred by war, starvation and disease, the sense of control the story implies must have been comforting. Avoid Hamlin's mistake, obey the rules of society, and catastrophe can be prevented. Prince Roswald did not go into his exile alone. He was accompanied by Stuart, who had served the family loyally for many years. After a long ride through punishing terrain, Roswell suggested they rest a while at a cooling stream. A sharp blow sent Roswell crashing unconscious to the ground. The steward sneered over him. Long had this man nursed resentment for his masters. Long had he cloaked his ambitions. Roswell's parents had given him gold enough to live in princely fashion. The wicked steward took it all. Donning Roswell's fine garments, the steward rode away with a prince's fortune and a prince's name. Poor Roswell was left for dead. Not all lawbreakers are as unpleasant as Roswell's treacherous steward. The good thief is an archetype found in cultures around the world. This rogue may break the laws of the land, but only to follow a higher code. In rebelling against the existing social order with all its flaws and inequalities, the good thief holds out the promise of something better. Amid the trees and woodland streams of the English forest, there once lurked a fugitive from the law. He was known by kings in their castles. He was beloved by peasants in the fields. He was a man of many identities. He was a trickster, a soldier, a rebel, a lord. His name was Robin Hood.
Since emerging in the 14th century, Robin has become one of the world's most famous and enduring legends. Today, his story seems familiar to us all. Robin lives in the woods with his merry men. He challenges the wrongful authority of the Sheriff of Nottingham, and he robs from the rich to give to the poor. Yet this familiarity disguises the evolution of this legend. For as society has changed down the centuries, so has Robin Hood. For what defines wrongful authority? What principles justify rebellion against it? Our answers are always shifting. In the earliest ballads and plays about him, Robin is no knight fallen on hard times, nor a nobleman denied his birthright. Instead, he is a man of the people, a yeoman, a little more than a peasant. The Robin Hood story is very much a story of ordinary people against authority. And Robin Hood is the nexus that allows authority to be challenged. He's saying something about the ordinary person, the ordinary yeoman bowman, having capabilities that aren't well understood by toffs. Robin Hood is smarter and better at shooting and better at defending himself than the people who think they're very smart because they've got account books and because they're good with abacuses. And that, in a way, is the point of him. That's what he's for. Stories about Robin were spread by word of mouth among ordinary people. And it was a time when they could do with a hero. The Black Death and other plagues had ravaged 14th century England. Civil war followed. Millions were killed or displaced. The stories of the defiant and clever Robin Hood offered rare victories for the common man. But he would not be theirs alone for long. In 1510, King Henry VIII himself played the outlaw at a court pageant. Even the high and mighty could not resist Robin's appeal. In the 16th century, England became a Protestant nation. As the country changed, so did the stories of Robin Hood. Soon it was not only the Sheriff of Nottingham he fought, but corrupt Catholic priests as well. Under Elizabeth I, however, authorities grew concerned. This legendary man of the people was becoming too popular. Robin Hood, they decided, was a threat to their power. Efforts were made to suppress the stories. If Robin Hood was to survive, he would have to change yet again. His savior was Elizabethan playwright Anthony Munday. He transformed the outlaw from a yeoman into the Earl of Huntingdon a fallen member of the aristocracy. This changed the target of Robin Hood's rebellion. In Monday's telling, the outlaw's conflict was only with corrupt authority. Now, a member of the aristocracy himself and a loyal servant of the true king, Robin became a representative of legitimate authority. And every time he defied the rulers of his fictional world, he reinforced the social structures of the Elizabethan. The next great shift came in the 19th century. The 19th century gets really keen on the medieval past. It's called medievalism. And this takes lots of different forms, like William Morris goes around trying to replicate medieval interiors and the look of medieval books, for example. You've got Tennyson writing poems about King Arthur, Idols of the King and the Maud Arthur. And Robin Hood's sort of part of that. People like Walter Scott rewrite the legend to bring it into line with the 19th century's idea of what the Middle Ages were. Robin becomes a literary figure, a popular figure. And once that happens, you get this romantic Robin Hood who is very much loved by all. He's loved by women, he's very, very charming. He's loved by good men. He's a true monarchist, which is very important in the expanding English empire. It was a time of urbanization, industry, and empire building. 
It's Robin Hood stories mingled nostalgia for a simpler medieval age with a muscular Victorian nationalism. The 19th century saw the popularity of the Robin Hood legend spread far beyond England. And in the 20th century, he would reach Hollywood. Since his early appearances in silent film, there have been dozens of screen adventures for Robin Hood. These depictions vary decade by decade, but they always question pressing issues of the day. In the 1920s, it was American isolationism. In the 30s, the Depression and Roosevelt's New Deal. In the 1950s, Britain's post-war reconstruction was the unspoken backdrop. In the 1970s, its tired decline. The 90s saw a new, more international Robin Hood with allies of different races and creeds. And we continue year after year to revisit the story and recraft it for our own age. For the appeal of Robin Hood seems undimmed by time. There's something immensely attractive about being an outlaw in connection with trees. I think it's just the idea of living in a world where you don't have to work, but where you have all kinds of important skills and you're living in this kind of almost Edenic nature. We like bad boys and I think this is what the Robin Hood legend sort of attracts us to, in that he's a bad boy with a heart of gold. So there's something very, very attractive about him. His identity, his enemies, and the questions he asks of us continue to evolve with every new screen adventure. Robin Hood is both a figure of comforting permanent tradition and a relentlessly contemporary rule breaker. This dual identity is at the heart of his endurance. It is through constant evolution that Robin Hood maintains his foothold in our imagination. After weeks of wandering, the exhausted Roswell came to a city. Behind walls high and true stood great houses of stone, and beyond them, in the heart of the city, the towers of a mighty fortress dazzled in the sun. Roswell marveled at its wide streets and busy markets, but the greatest wonder was still to come. It was in the palace yard he saw her. He was transfixed. She was the most beautiful creature he had ever seen. Roswell summoned up his courage to speak with her. But before they had exchanged more than a few words, a harsh cry came from the palace. Princess Lillian, come at once. Your father wishes to speak with you. Reluctantly, the princess obeyed. Roswell stared longingly after her. She's not meant for the likes of us, lad, the passerby mocked. She's to marry some fine prince, I hear. Sure enough, just days later, the prince promised to Lillian arrived at the castle. Roswell joined the crowds at the gate, but when he saw the prince, he was stunned. It was none other than the treacherous steward who had stolen his fortune and his princely name. He was the man dear Lillian was to wed. Sudden reversals in fortune like those of Paul Roswell are difficult for individuals to bear. Whole societies can fare a little better. Balancing people's competing demands is difficult at the best of times. A sudden shock can make it impossible. One such shock came in the 16th century. In 1517, German monk Martin Luther defied the teachings of the Catholic Church. He ignited a religious revolution. The Reformation had begun. 
Soon, Europe was divided as never before. Families, communities, and nations were split, Catholic and Protestant. Wars of religion scarred the continent, and the bloodiest of all was the Thirty Years' War. With almost eight million casualties, the conflict was one of the longest and most destructive in European history. It began in the Holy Roman Empire, a fragmented land of tiny kingdoms and principalities. All of these little kingdoms were caught up in a stupendous war about whether Catholics or Protestants should succeed to one of these little kingdoms. But all of them ended up getting involved and it started in 1618 and it just banged on and on and on. This was the epoch of the war which proverbially laid waste to Germany. Germany was the theater of war for all of Europe. The pretty normal experience was for the other side to ride into your village and just kill everybody. And I really mean everybody. That kind of nightmare experience became quite commonplace and must have altered people's sense of the world. Caught up in this conflict was the North Bavarian town of Bamberg. It was a town built at the meeting of two rivers, 40 miles downstream from Nuremberg. It had grown in the shadow of a mountain fortress, but at its heart was the church. A four-towered cathedral loomed over the rooftops, and Catholicism dominated everyday life. Bamberg in the early 17th century was a typically South German, typically Bavarian place. It would have had a strongly established Roman Catholic culture. Bamberg was a prince archbishopric presided over by successive archbishops who strongly wanted to oppose the spread of Protestantism. It defined itself over against the newly established and threatening Protestant culture just a few leagues up the road. In 1623, Johann Georg von Dornheim became the city's prince bishop. Von Dornheim was a Jesuit. He was utterly committed to the Catholic Church and obsessed with pushing back Protestantism. The bishop was a rather extreme character, even by the standards of his day. He appears to have exploited his office as Prince Bishop of Bamberg to apply the most rigoristic uh, form uh, of witch hunting. Witch hunts were not new in Bamberg. They had taken place under several of von Dornheim's predecessors. But von Dornheim took the practice to extremes. Not for nothing was he dubbed the Hexenbrenner, the witch burner. Hundreds were accused, put on trial, and executed. In 1627, von Dornheim ordered the construction of the Witch House. This special prison had 28 cells and torture chambers. It was here he secured his confessions. there was quite lavish torture used to force a confession from witches. And we know this because one of the suspects actually smuggled the letter out to his daughter. It's incredibly sad, explaining what had been done to him, explaining why he'd had to name names and betray people, even though he knew what he was saying wasn't true. And it was the standard array of medieval tortures, thumb screws, the boots, and the strapado, which mostly rely not only on pain, but on creating disfigurement and disability. Neither age nor rank proved a defense against accusation. Among those executed were the mayor and his wife. Georg Hahn, a prominent doctor in the town, opposed the trials, but that only made him a target for the bishop.
Japan, his wife, his son, and two daughters were all burned at the stake. Witches have featured in European mythology and folklore for thousands of years, but they were never confined to the safe world of the story. Many believed in sorcery and blamed it for misfortune in their everyday life. There has never been a society that didn't have at least a residual belief in witchcraft. It's not a recent thing. It doesn't suddenly bound into existence in the 17th century. What happens though, and this is important, in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, people started trying to prosecute everyone who they thought was guilty of witchcraft. And by the time of the Bamberg trials, it was a serious matter for the secular courts with capital punishment to follow. The theological and legal foundation for witch trials was found in a book published in the late 15th century, the Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer of the Witches, defined witchcraft as a pact with the devil and laid down ways to combat this alleged evil. The prosecution of witches was not restricted to Germany, however. Similar trials took place throughout Europe. Both Protestant and Catholic communities took part. In a tiny village in Sweden, more than 70 people were beheaded in a single day. Hundreds were killed in Scotland, and the Spanish Inquisition accused thousands. A moral panic was gripping Europe. But what could drive whole societies to such inhuman acts? For hundreds of years in the Middle Ages, Europe benefited from long summers and mild winters. Crops were plentiful and the seas free of ice. But this medieval warm period did not last forever. By the 16th century, Europe had become colder. Rivers froze, snows lingered long into spring, and crops failed again and again. There was widespread famine. Months of rain ruined crops, and there were no charitable agencies, of course, to prevent people starving in their villages. What people thought they knew about the weather was constantly violated, and that upset them terribly and made them feel that something was causing all this. People are very reluctant to believe that nature is as changeable as it actually is. If your harvest fails for one year, but then another year, and then another year, these things appear to be against the course of nature. Because they appear to be unnatural, of course, it's natural for the collective mind to seek a supernatural reason for it. It's that kind of collective thinking which surely would have played a significant role in the collective fury of the witch hunts. The Bamberg trials finally ended after the Swedish intervention in the Thirty Years' War. King Gustavus Adolphus invaded Germany in defense of Protestantism. In February of 1632, his forces neared Bamberg. The Bishop von Dornheim fled. The remaining prisoners in the witch house were released. They were told never to speak of the torture inflicted upon them. The trials in Bamberg are a frightening example of what can happen when society turns on itself when it seeks out the saboteurs and the enemies within, when it embarks on a witch hunt.
In the 19th century, Britain was transformed. A steam-powered revolution was underway. Railways cut through the countryside. Chimneys pierced the sky. The roar of metal-toothed machinery filled the air, and black smoke veiled the heavens. The Industrial Revolution made Britain a global superpower. It reshaped the landscape of the country, and it altered the lives of its people forever. Although creating great wealth and beginning to improve living standards of even the poorest, this new age of industry was also disrupting established ways of life. Old jobs were disappearing and towns were swallowing up people in their thousands. The cities were transformed by factories and mills. They became dark and dirty. People started doing what we would now think of as a really long work day, actually. They typically were roused by the factory siren at sort of seven in the morning and didn't stagger home again till six at night. When you get new communities, you really have to create myths and legends that allow people to deal with that environment and allow people to identify themselves with that environment. Once you've got people living in the rookeries, they're going to start trying to make up stories about where they are, and they're going to start trying to incorporate this nightmare landscape of thick smoke and fog and blackened buildings and hungry children into their mythology as a way of coping with it. There aren't the certainties of the old small communities where everybody knew everybody. So the Industrial Revolution was a great sort of upset to old communities, but it also created new communities. And it's the transition between the old and new communities where you get a lot of new legends and myths starting to emerge. The first rumors began circulating in the autumn of 1837. In the villages south of London, a monstrous fiend was on the loose described as a great white bull or bear. Something had attacked several people, and women were its favorite target. As the rumors spread closer to the heart of the city, the strange creature's form shifted. It became more human and all the more frightening. It was an unearthly visitant, clad in armor and long clawed gloves who struck at night before escaping with great leaps over the city rooftops. By early 1838, authorities could no longer ignore the phenomenon. On the 8th of January, Sir John Cowan, Lord Mayor of the City of London, publicized a letter he had received from a resident of South London. The letter warned of the strange apparition and the terror growing among the people. The Lord Mayor, however, was dismissive. These attacks were either made up or the work of malicious pranksters. The Times printed the Mayor's announcement the next day. The monster made another leap, this time into the imaginations of people around the country. He soon had a name as well. Spring-Heeled Jack. This is where you really see the media beginning to take the legend and feed back into the legend. Terrible event in somewhere, great outrage in, I mean, you know, the usual things. But you also had a lot of chapbooks, which are sort of little, almost like little paperbacks, little sort of paper books, which were sold by peddlers all over the country. It comes from the kind of literature that usually gets characterized as the penny dreadful, which is a literature deliberately produced for and to some extent also by the ordinary kids who are just about literate, who love a good story, who love to be scared. The idea of something, something jumping at you is like a popcorn moment in a horror film, basically. And this is part of the thing that appealed to people. They like to be scared. spring Hill Jack was a blend of the old and new. He was a figure reminiscent of ancient superstition, yet was strikingly modern in his appearance. Whether the attacks were real or fabricated in many ways doesn't matter. The fact that the story spread so quickly and were believed by so many 
reveals an anxiety at work in Victorian society. For with his metal claws and furnace mouth, spring -Hill Jack was the dark personification of this new industrial urban world. A new demon, hidden among the anonymous masses of the city. It must have seemed to people that they were living in hell. At night you could see the fires from the potteries for miles and miles and the smoke belching out. Why would you not think that this was part of a kind of modern demonology? This notion of a character who can jump quickly looks like the devil. Sometimes he's skeletal, sometimes he's got fiery eyes. But he also begins to take on characters of the gothic hero in that he can be dressed as a gentleman and he has a long cloak. So you can see this figure being created about all of the fascinations and anxieties of the Victorian world. I suspect Spring Hill Jack struck people as a kind of emanation of the Industrial Revolution itself. The darkness, the terrible smog and fogs that overtook the country, the fact that even the trees turned black. He's the perfect urban legend for the Victorian era. He's a criminal, he's supernatural. You never know when he's going to appear. He attacks the vulnerable. But of course, if you read about him in a chapbook or a newspaper or see him on stage, somehow you're safe. Three days of jousting were announced to celebrate the nuptials of Princess Lillian. The crowd roared as the jousts began. But sitting in the royal box beside her husband-to-be, Lillian could not muster even a smile. Across the tourney field, the miserable Roswell paid little heed to the spectacle either. When the jousting came to an end, the victors paraded down the ground. The custom was for them to stop and bow at the royal box. But not this day. Instead, the three knights ignored the imposter prince and rode on towards the other side of the ground. There, among the common people, they found Rosal. It was to him they bowed. Rosal was stunned until the knights removed their helmets. They were the noblemen he had freed from his father's dungeon. They denounced the imposter in the royal box and proclaimed Roswell the true prince. Arrest them, the steward cried, but nobody moved. Arrest them! The more he shouted, the less princely he looked. Instead of the royal bride he hoped for, the steward received a traitor's death. His head was left to rot above the city gates. Reclaiming his royal title, Roswell married Lillian. The happy kingdom they inherited lived in peace and justice all the rest of their days. With roots in earlier folklore, the story of Roswell was a popular one in 16th century England and Scotland. It was a tale of social order uprooted and then restored. An attractive proposition for many in what was a time of religious upheaval and national uncertainty. For change is often frightening. Too much can tear society apart, but too little and society withers. In times of change, stories can be a comfort to cling to or a tool to probe with. They can be a reminder of shared history or a vision of a possible future. The best of them have lingered in our memory for centuries. The tensions in society reflected by those tales have not disappeared completely, however. We remain a jumble of contradictions just about muddling by. But as was ever the case, is in the stories we cherish, in the legends we believe, and in the myths we retell, that those contradictions are debated and our values are tested. <laughs>